Need your daily fix on mixed martial arts? We're going to kind of recap Bellator 155. From UFC 198. Who's who? Kind of a controversial decision. And who's not? I couldn't figure out why, and then they hit me. Well, don't you fret, because Golden State Media Concepts got, got you covered. covered. Get your daily dose of MMA podcasts. Everything from the UFC, Bellator Fighting Championships, Extreme Cage Fighting, Invictus Fighting Championships, and, and, and so, so much, much more. more. Join us as we talk about some of the biggest names in mixed martial arts. We've got you covered here on Golden State Media Concepts MMA Podcast. Thank you for tuning into the GSMC MMA Podcast brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I'm your host Arnel DeLeon and hopefully you're doing well for yourself. You, your friends, your family, whether you live in the States, which is pretty dark right now, or internationally, I hope you're doing fine for yourself. To those of you who are unaware, currently uh, in the States, reopening up has been delayed. Um, In the States, it was meant California and a bunch of other states were going to reopen up at the 4th of July, which I find so interesting and funny. Yeah, 4th of July, Independence, America, hurrah, hurrah. So it was going to open up 4th of July. Currently, at the time of this recording, it's right now July 1st. And California has delayed its reopening. Florida, Texas, and Nevada have um, and Nevada have prevented the reopening. They're delaying that. So right now, we're kind of unsure what to expect. There could be a second wave happening, and hopefully that doesn't happen. So while everything is getting, you know, a lot more dark, a lot more worse, and in other avenues of, you know, the sports world, things are getting a lot more darker... But right now, one thing that we can be sure on is that UFC will continue to happen. A mixed martial arts event, combat sports, is still going to continue on at Fight Island. As I am speaking right now, currently Dana White, I think, is on his way to Fight Island. Because he wasn't there during the Dustin Poirier-Dan Hooker fight. He wasn't there. Um, he was off. Uh, he was off, and I think he was at Fight Island. He says he's going to be at all the Fight Island events, with the exception of being the last one. And right now, with Fight, the Fight Island show, it's going to come up in two weeks. Yeah, it's about two weeks, less than two weeks. So right now, yeah, about ten days. Yeah. So we got we got another uh, event coming up on July 11th. It's going to be a it's going to be a crazy show here. And so I am I really am excited. I really am excited for Fight Island to happen. We got a lot of um, big fights happening. We got we got title fights and title championship matches happening. We got the rise of Gilbert Burns. We don't know. When we don't know what to expect from the show, to be honest to you, but I don't. You got Volkanovski versus Max Holloway, the return of Rose Dombey Eunice. I don't know how mentally she's doing it in the head. We got Gilbert Burns 2020, without a doubt, is the year of Gilbert Burns if he were to go defeat Kamar Usman. So I'm excited for that. I think Burns has a real chance against Usman. I'm currently betting on Kamar Usman to defeat Gilbert Burns primarily because he's a safe bet. That's really it. I won't be surprised if Gilbert Burns defeats Kamaru Usman. I really won't be surprised. I'm just picking Kamaru Usman right now, just because he has more, he just he has more experience over Gilbert Burns, uh, considering the fact that he's a current champion. But then again, I predict the time will be defeating Gilbert Burns. I could be completely wrong. Gilbert Burns could be defeating Kamaru Usman. That's a real possibility. I'm just going with the safe bet in Usman right now. But no disrespect to Gilbert Burns. If he ends up defeating Kamaru Usman, without a doubt, this would be the year of Burns. And if he gets maybe one more fight in <laughs> this year, which is really insane, just wow. Talk about the most hardest working person in all the UFC, making all the money. I have mad respect to him. Huge, huge mad respect. But one fight I do want to talk about right now is Jessica Andrade versus Rose Namajunas. And that's because Rose Namajunas, after months, has finally done an interview where she's actually... Because Rose Namajunas is one of those fighters where she's like really popular... She's really popular, former champion. She's got a great character. There's a lot of people who like Rose Namajunas. Like, I love seeing Rose Namajunas. She had the best round of her entire fighting career <laughs> against Jessica Andrade. And then the second round, everything just plummeted. And so, Rose Namajunas, she came back. Uh, she finally did an interview. She, Rose Namajunas also isn't all that vocal, either. She's not really the type of person who would go on Twitter and, like, trash talk another person. That usually doesn't happen. And so... To see Rose Namunas be back, I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, I finally get to see Rose. Because there was a period in time, for you, uh, for those who don't remember, that when you were saying, okay, who is the best women's fighters in the entire world? 
you would chalk it down to Amanda Nunes, Chris Cyborg, and Rose Namunas. There, there's the three fighters you think about. And at this time period, they were the three champions. Where, uh, where uh, Nunes was... Nunes was the bantamweight champion. Uh, Chris Cyborg was the inaugural feather champion, I think. I think she was the inaugural. Like, the division was pretty much built around her. And then you had Rose Namunas, who had a fight of the year candidates against Ioana Chechek. And then after that, she then ended up winning the women's stride belt. So now we're thinking about, okay, who is the best women's fighter in the world? Norman Yunus, Nunes, or Chris Cyborg? And a lot of people were saying, hey, you know what? Like, Rose Norman Yunus has the most star potential out of the three. Which is so strange to think about it now. Because a lot of people, when Nunes defeated Holly Holm and, Rose, and um, uh, Ronda Rousey, a lot of people were speculating, you know what? Yeah, Amanda Nunes is a great fighter, but she's hard to sell. If that makes any sense. It's confusing because you can obviously sell her. She is without a doubt the greatest women's fighter of all time in UFC history. And so there, but there was a hard sell for, uh, for Amanda Nunes. And there's a hard sell for Chris Cyborg considering the fact that a lot of Chris Cyborg's mistake comes from the hypothetical matchup of if she were to fight against Ronda Rousey. And now you have this up and comer here in Rosalind Muniz. She's about 24, 26 years old. She was only in her mid twenties when she uh, she was in her early to mid twenties when she when she defeated Yuana Chechek, and she's such like a humble good person. Uh, here's the thing: Rose Namunas is one of the only people in the UFC, even though her nickname is Thug Rose, who comes across as the most down to earth human being. Seriously, like especially now when when you got the Kobe Covingtons in the world, you got Chael Sonnen's, you got Kamar Usman in this past year. Has been really awful about this. Uh, ben, uh, not us, Ben Askren during this time. Jorge Masvidal. We got a lot of we got a lot of people playing characters of trying to be this like overly tough, like heavily masculine, being like I am the best in the world, and they're trash talking people, which I really dislike. I absolutely hate it. I no, I think I enjoyed the trash talking and somebody playing the WWE style pro wrestling character once in a while. I enjoy it once in a while, but when you have multiple people doing it, I really dislike it. So it was fun when Chael Sonnen did it against Anderson Silva, but now there's like a bunch of Chael Sonnen's like out there try, like, trying to replicate. Like Alexander Hernandez is one of the worst case scenarios out there who's trying way too hard to you know, to be the antagonistic pro wrestling heel character. And when everyone's trying to play a pro, a, a pro wrestling heel character, then who's the baby face? That's, what, that's something that a lot of people are... That's something a lot of people are, are like forgetting about. Is that the whole point of the antagonistic kill character that people are playing nowadays? Is that hey man, I got a big mouth and I'm talking like you know I'm talking mess about everyone. Guess what? The, the narrative and the story behind that is that at some point the heel character will get his comeuppance because Chael Sonnen got his comeuppance against the good guy hero in Anderson Silva. You might be cheering for Anderson Silva, you might be cheering for Chael Sonnen, but the narrative is <laughs> Chael Sonnen says himself, he's the bad guy. He's the bad guy and people want to see him get beat up. Kobe Covington also. And now we have fighters like Kamar Usman and Jorge Masvidal who this time last year were kind of the babyface good guys of the UFC and now they're the bad guys. And then you have these like neutral chaos like fighters like Conor McGregor. It's when I want to see good guy characters or people with like a good, uh, like a nice personality to listen to for once. Like somebody who comes across as approachable. Not somebody who's always, you know, on Twitter trash talking people that don't lead to anywhere. There's a lot of divas and there's a lot of drama happening in the UFC. Dana has talked about it a lot. I like, I think a large reason as to why Dana White doesn't respect the fighters that much is because a lot of the fighters are their own biggest marks. And it gets absolutely ridiculous. And then we have Rose Namunas here, who's the only fighter, I think who's like, who's like only the very few champions out there, who just spoke naturally. You know, like, he's like, she's a whatever person. She seemed like the type of person that you would bring to like a Starbucks and have like a 30 minute conversation with and have a relaxing time with her. Like that's really how Rose Namunas comes across as. I suppose... To, if I brought like a Chris Cyborg or a Kobe Covington or a Ben Askren, it's not going to be a two-way conversation. No way. It's just going to be one person cutting a pro wrestling promo in front of my face for 30 minutes and then going off on a tangent while filming themselves going off on a tangent so, they would, so they'll use on social media to go get more followers. It just... Ugh. 
It gets infuriating. It really does. Um, so, Rose Namiyunas finally came back. She did an interview with Errol Hawani at ESPN. You can go look it up at YouTube. It's a really nice interview for her. It's, really, it's a really nice interview because one of the only very few interviews out there where their guard is obviously down. And it's super interesting, really. It really is. Because Rose Namiyunas, in this interview, she had a she had a couple interesting things to say here. Uh, first off, she didn't... Uh, she, she, she The way how she explains it as... The reason I was why she was gone for a while is because she was still in that period of adulting, where she's champion. She she was champion in her early to mid twenties. She's on top of the world. There's a lot of fame going her way, but she still acts kind of a kid. She's only in her early to mid twenties. Like she's not. <laughs> here's, here's something people need to know about. Uh, I myself, I'm still in my twenties. It's. <sighs> Okay, and so I'm in my 20s, and I teach uh, middle school and elementary school kids here. And one kid brought this up to me one time, which is really astounding. Uh, he's like this like fourth, fifth grade kid, and he told people that he told that people in the 20s are called the lookers. And the reason why they called the lookers is because all we do is look at our phone the entire day. And one fourth, fifth grade kid ended up bringing up that like it's dumb that you want us to mature. But yet, no one, none of you guys mature. And if you go on YouTube, there are people in their 30s that still act as if we're like 17, 16 years old. Like, do you know, like, like, Chael Sonnen, Ben Askren, Kobe Covington stuff? Like, that's, it's super childish. It really is. A lot of what happens in mixed martial arts is incredibly childish. And so you have Rose Namajunas going into this field where... You have these grown-ups acting like they're still a junior or senior in high school. And like, and they're playing a character. And Rose Namias herself is still in the period of like growing up. She's, I think, 25. I think she was like 24, 26 when she won the belt. So she had this like huge... She had this huge obstacle that goes beyond just the... This just goes beyond the, the octagon. Where she was trying to be like... like I'm trying to be a grown-up. I'm getting my house. I got to deal with relationships. I got it with money. I got it with my family member. I got it with family stuff. Just, the problems that Rose Namajunas has to go through is far different from the problems of like someone like an Alexander Gustafsson or a Jorge Masvidal or a John Jones. Like you got people in their mid thirties. It's weird because a, a lot of these champions, dude, most of the champions in the UFC are all are, are significantly much more older than Rose Namunas. The only other older fighter out there, younger fighter, would be, like, Welly Zhang. And even then, Welly Zhang comes from, like, a different country. And so the way how she deals with adulting and growing up is very different there compared to America, because America has a huge adulting, America has that huge adulting maturity problem that's going on right now. So for Rose Namunas, when she was uh, talking the interview with Ayo Hawani, she was mostly going on about, on about as the reason why she's not really been active is because ever since she lost the belt, A, it was a huge ego hit, and B, she was in the period of, like, she went through the midlife 20, uh, the midlife crisis 20 phase, that every, that if you, if you guys have never, haven't gone through it, you understand, where you're, you're, like, 25 years old, and you finish college, or you're cemented at a career for the first time, and things are going really well for you, and then, boom, something happens to you, in her case, it's a loss, and now you're stuck now. Because you've been practicing and training yourself your entire life to be good at a certain skill. It happened, it happened to me essentially, where I have, like, I have like 11 years experience, um, in like, in a certain field, I'm like, in, in the, in the field of media. And then I did a job. I ended up being let go from it, and it was a huge mental hit from it. I was like, oh my gosh, I've been practicing like 11 years of my life to be good at this one thing. And then now, like, I have problems with like money and housing and relationships and all this other stuff. And I should be settled already at this point in my life, but things aren't really settled, and there's a lot of hurdles I still have to go through. It gets infuriating, because you think the hurdles would be over college and high school. Those are just some hurdles, and then there are other hurdles beyond that that a lot of people are just not prepped up for. And for Rose Namunas being so successful at an early age, and for her right now saying, yeah, adulting was a huge issue for me, really. I was the best in the world. And then I lost, I lost confidence in myself. And it makes sense why she would lose confidence. She had the best, perfect fight, perfect round you can ever ask for. Without a doubt, Rose Namunas came into her fight against Jessica Andrade as the underdog. Saying that Jessica Andrade was the better all-around fighter than Rose Namunas. 
with Jessica Andrade being the better striker than Rose Namunas coming into that fight. And so Namunas was the world champion, came into that fight as the underdog, had a perfect first round. And then the second round, she just made one mistake. And then she just allowed herself to be grabbed and slammed to the ground. And then she lost it all. She lost it all. It's just, it, it's a really tragic story of what happened to Rose Namunas. And so for her to tell, tell her side of the story, being like, yeah, I lost. Huge ego hit. I still gotta grow up. A lot of things weren't going my way in my personal life. Also, she had family members who passed away due to coronavirus. It was hard. So I'm happy for Rosalind Muniz to bounce herself back into the UFC, and I can't wait for a fight, her big comeback fights. You're listening to the GSMC MMA podcast. Come back right after a short break here. See you soon. Check out the show built around the women of MMA. From the UFC to the extreme cage fighting, we got the fights covered. Listen. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Women's MMA Podcast. The latest news of upcoming fights, discussions of previous matches. Join us as we talk to and about the biggest names in women's mixed martial arts. Past, present, and future. When it's the women's fight game, you know where to listen to. The Golden State Media Concepts Women's MMA Podcast. This is your ultimate stop for everything sports. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Should I say more? From the NFL, MLB, the NBA, to MMA. It's all in here. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Listen now. And we are back. So while Rose Namunas is making her big comeback, she'll be coming back in a weird, weird scenario, and that is at Fight Island. And Fight Island, it's still bizarre and weird and strange thinking about, you know, fighters coming together at like uh, at a uh, you know island and they're gonna and they're gonna battle it out at a cage. It sounds like a straight out of a movie. Because it really does. It really is. So it is coming in from MMAJunkie.USAToday.com with the headline being Paul Felder details preparation to call every bounce on Fight Island. I really want to know, like, what is there to expect from the show? Well, this coming in from Mike, uh, uh, Mike Bone. Paul Felder is going to have a strong presence on UFC broadcast, which the promotion heads to Fight Island for four events in July. A UFC lightweight contender, Paul Felder, who's 17-5 at MMA uh, in his MMA career, 9-5 at the UFC, has made a seamless transition into the commentary booth over the past few years. He hasn't fully moved on from fighting, but he admits broadcasting is taking, more up and, uh, p- taking up, up more and more of his time, and will be a major part of his future when he retires from the competition for good. Felder's assignments are often interchanged with the likes of Daniel Cormier, Dominic Cruz, Michael Bisping, and a few others. Telling right now, Michael Bisping is my favorite commentator. <laughs> Just because he is the most, like, wackiest guy to listen to in commentary. It seems like he's riffing, to be honest with you. Like, Dominic Cruz is the no-nonsense, like, pretentious person trying to talk about mixed martial arts. Daniel Cormier, he's trying to be as professional as he can. Michael Bisping, he just sounds like he's riffing. Have you guys any watched, like, the show called Mr. Uh, Mr. Um, I think Mystery Space Theater 2000? Yeah, yeah, yeah I think it's called like, Mystery Space Theater... Uh, th- uh, 3000. And in the show, like, it's like them riffing, and they're not really analyzing anything. They're just making fun. There's, they're doing some analysis and just riffing on it, just making fun of what's happening. And this is what Michael commentary is. Where, like, he's like, half the time he's calling the fight, half the time he's making fun of them, half the time he's, like, bringing up, like, American values and just trashing it. He's like, man, Americans are weird, you know? Like, what's with their accent? Uh,. But uh, but he goes on to say, but now he's on the cusp of his busiest stretch yet, with UFC hosting cards on July 11, July 15, July 18, and July 25th. That's four cards happening in 14 days. Yikes. It's happening on Yas Island at Abu Dhabi. Felder revealed he will be serving as a commentator for all 40 plus fights, alongside with some combination of Michael Bisping, Jen Anik, Jen Gooden, and Dan Hardy. I'm calling every fight, Feller told MMA Junkie. I'm working the desk for every fight and calling every fight. I'm out there all three weeks, so I've got a lot of work to do as well. There's quite a lot of research when you have to call for four fights. There's a lot of research when you have to call for four fights and also talk pre- and post-fight shows as well. 
Felder said that July 25th card is the least of his worries, as uh, as he'll have one week to prepare between shows. Prior to that, though, there are three cards in seven days, including a total of four championship bouts. The highest level fights where belts are for grabs, of course, will attract the most attention from the public. However, Paul Felder said he feels a responsibility to treat each contest with equal respect. Several athletes who have minimal UFC experience are slated to compete at the events. Felder said it's imperative to tell the, tell them all stories and detail all the techniques with the same level of respect. That last one, I will have plenty of time, but the first three, I've got to be ready and ahead of it and start prepping the first couple now, Felder said. Then once at first, the, then once the first is done, I'll freshen up on the second show and starting research on the third show. I like to get a little idea of a little idea of everybody, especially the prelim guys that might slip under the radar on occasion. I want to make sure I'm on point and giving those guys their credit and really showcasing them properly. Not only does Felder have a heavy workload of calling the fights, then serving as an analyst on the pre and post show content, but he also faces some very unique conditions due to the time difference. From the U.S., the main cars for Fort Island, shows will begin no earlier than 1 a.m. local time. 1 a.m. If you want to watch these show, man, you got to be up for it. And it's going to be difficult for me, letting you know that. Not as difficult as Paul Felder, but, oh uh, man, it's it's tough. It's tough. Uh, by the way, I, I'm a huge pro wrestling fan. And I would watch the show called Wrestle Kingdom, which happens in Japan. It's from... Uh, Organization called New Japan Pro Wrestling, and their shows start around like two thirty a.m. in the morning here in America. And I've done it. I've done it where, and they're like seven hour shows, like five to seven hour shows. They're prelims. Last year's Wrestle Kingdom was a two day event. It was so difficult to watch those shows at like two thirty in the morning. Got to watch the pre show. Got to watch the, the all the post show con- uh, post press uh, press conference interviews. It was difficult. So I kind of get where he's going at. This, this is going to be a really difficult thing to go through as a fan. Felder competed on the UFC's most recent show in Abu Dhabi, which was UFC 242 in, this, in September, but the situation was different. The start time was better suited for a local market, and athletes had a greater amount of time to adjust to the climate. There's no envy from Felder for the fighters competing, and he's curious to see how everyone daps. I think the best thing to do is go over there and just sleep and train when you can. I agree with him. If you're t- if you're feeling tired, just freaking sleeping, which I do, which I do go through. If you want to work out, just work out. I wouldn't worry too much about. I have a. I have to sleep at this time. So Paul Felder goes on about uh, what's happening in Abu Dhabi, and I'll tell you right now. Jorge Masvidal made fun of uh, made fun of like the commentary team, and the analysts, and the fact that he was alluding to the idea that b- these fighters. These former fighters slash kind of kind of semi-active fighters are doing the analyst job because they can't make it at a high level being full-time active fighters. And what he's saying is kind of true, not true, really. And uh, with the exception of Daniel Cormier and Dominic Cruz, all the other fighters, I, well, no, no, you got Michael Bisping, you got Dominic Cruz, uh, you got uh, Daniel Cormier, you got uh, Dan Hardy, former top contender, uh, you got Michelle Watterson, uh, former Adam champion. It's like, yeah, like the, like the analysts and the commentary crew, like, they they have a good pedigree. They have really good pedigree of fight experience on, under their books. Uh, but then you have, like, fighters like Brian Stan. Like, why is Brian, like, Brian Stan, Paul Felder, I was like, really? Like, you guys, I'm not really interested in your guys' viewpoints and how, like, you look at the world of mixed martial arts. I'd rather listen to Dominic Cruz and Michael Bisping over Paul Felder and a, and a Brian Stan or a Frank Mir. I, I'm, I'm being honest because like, there, there's some fighters I'm interested in, some fighters I'm not interested in. But you know, I've listened to Paul Felder uh, since he's been calling all the fights. Good on him. I'm always a supporter for fighters, uh, or for fighters or former fighters, to know how to make money in a secondary way. Because according to Dana White, this is not a career. This is an opportunity. But being a broadcaster, that's a career. And so I'm happy for Paul, for Paul Felder because you're not making that much money as a UFC fighter. You really are not. You can't make... Okay, no, you can make a lot of money. You can. It just, you know, the possibility of you making a real, like six figures is really difficult, especially for the fighters fighting the undercard because you got some fighters out there who are making $9,000 per fight, $12,000 per fight. There's some fighters who are making like $24,000 per fight on top of their win bonus 
and showing up per year, it gets really hard. So for Paul Felder, good on him for learning to make money. Dan Cormier has talked about it where he says, you know what? They're being paid really good. We're, we are being paid really well for ourselves doing this broadcast job. So I respect Paul Felder for being able to make income in multiple ways. I respect him. I respect any person. And not, not, this is not just for mixed martial arts, but in life. Everyone should find alter, alternative ways of making money on top of what they're already making right now. Everyone should do that just because it's good to, have, to make double the income. Because, you know, stuff like the coronavirus pandemic can, you know, halt your progress. And things get really difficult for you. But I also I also relate to Paul well, to Paul Felder's situation here and the fact that he has to do research for all these fighters here. Letting you right now, I don't know all the fighters. I don't know because you don't pay a lot of these prelim fighters have like maybe two three fights experience in the UFC or are just coming into the UFC. Like Kay Hansen, like I know Kay Hansen from a time in Invicta, but a large majority of people don't know who Kay Hansen is. And so when when it was um so when Kay Hansen signed the contract. For the UFC, I already knew a little bit about her, but I had to go more into learning about Kay Hansen before, you know, her actually diving deep into her first fight in, um, in the UFC, which is like, what, a week ago. So there's a lot of research that goes on for sports broadcasting. For those of you who think, you know, doing commentary is easy, yes, some commentary is easy, okay? If you go on YouTube, doing commentary over a video game, that's easy, because you can do blind playthroughs. You can go pick up like random bad game or some good game. Go in it blindly because people are watching those views for like for genuine reactions. Genuine reactions. But if you're calling like a sports event, which I've done, I've, I've called a I called like basketball events and football events um, during my time in college and in high school. So I'd call these events, and in college it was so hard <laughs> calling these game calling, calling these games. I called a baseball game. And I'm not interested in that much in baseball. And baseball has a huge roster. Like, like I know that I know the general basic terms of like baseball, like RBIs and stuff, and like RBIs. But like I don't know each person in the field. And there was a tournament that happened. There was a tournament that happened three days where we had a baseball team that would play two different teams in one day, and it was in three consecutive days. So I had to learn my team. I had to learn six other teams that were happening, that were, that, like six, four other teams that were also on the field, and there was a possibility that I would be calling another game of two teams that I did not know prior of, or was even told prior of, I'll be, I'll be calling for those games. So it's ridiculous, it really is. The good thing about Paul Felder is the fact that he's an actual fan of mixed martial arts, and so his ability to call the stuff is really easy for me. Uh, I'm a huge basketball nerd, and so calling basketball stuff was really simple for me, and it was like, very natural. I can do it. But calling football games, calling baseball games, and you have to learn all these athletes' names. You gotta learn their backstories. You gotta look up obscure interviews about these about these athletes here, so you have something interesting to tell uh, to tell when you're on broadcasting because you got thousands upon millions of people listening to you. It gets really stressful. It really does. Even in basketball. Even though I love basketball. Same way even though I know Paul Felder loves mixed martial arts. I have to do a bunch of research on these like players that I that I just don't that I don't know. Like num- number thirty two there, um, you know, he's a great outside shooter. He's really good um uh, playing up at the, uh, playing at the high key there. He likes things posting up. He prefers, you know, doing a spin move towards the left side. And then he's going after this one defender. This one defender over there has like, you know, like a like an X like an X in like an X inch vertical. He's really good at help defense, and you got this other player here who's really good at playing at the who's really who's a really strong wing defender who played who had thirty two points in the previous game, but before that he only had two points, so he's very inconsistent. Blah blah blah. <laughs> it gets really tiring. It really does. It's uh, I can relate to Paul Felder. So to those of you who are saying, you know what, like doing commentary is easy. Some commentary jobs are easy. Some commentary jobs are difficult. So, Paul Felder, good on you for making money. Good on you for doing all the research right now for the fighters. Because when I do research for these fighters, it gets kind of like, you get information overload. You just get this information overload, and then you're watching these fights, and you're writing down notes. And you're like, oh my gosh, it's so confusing. Ah! Um, To be honest with you, I think uh, calling fights for the more popular fighters is the easiest thing you can do. Like, like Khabib Nurmagomedov versus Conor McGregor. That's an easy fight to call. That's an easy fight to call. 
Because, like, you've seen these two fighters fight so often, that you kind of know what to expect of these two. Also, since they're both very famous and very popular, and they're also throwing themselves out there in social media, it's pretty easy to, like, call or, like, to tell stories or to bring up interesting information about these fighters. But then you have some fighters out there who you, who you really don't know that much, especially if you're a newcomer or casual to the fight game. Like, like, like Charles Oliveira has went through this, like, weird, like, second, second phase of his, like, MMA career that unless you've been paying attention to, you wouldn't have predicted that. And so, uh, a lot of things are happening uh, for Fight Island. The commentary team is stressed. Dana White is stressed. you got these fighters here who are meant to compete at 1 a.m. American time, which is ridiculous. I agree with Paul Felder in the fact that if you're... It, it, it's all, it also happens not just there, but also happens like in places like Mexico or even Denver, where if you're not used to the climate or not used to the environment or area around you, you have a tendency of like shutting down, of, like, of, of shutting down. Because your body isn't just like used to the actual environment. As a person who's like, I played basketball, and it's really mind numbing for me to play at an indoor building versus playing out, like outdoors. Playing outdoor basketball versus playing indoor basketball, two entirely different things. And for these athletes out there, if they don't get their sleep schedules on time, they'll have to fight at a certain time and their body's all like, you know, tired, it's all banged up, and they still have to deal with the weight cut issue. Because weight cutting is really difficult right now because, you know, like saunas and steam rooms. They're not available, but according to the UFC, like their specific, their specific area where they have these fighters stay at, they have gyms that can be used. I'm still unsure what to expect from there, but right now, but a lot of things are very confusing and very innovative and very innovative right now for the UFC and in mixed martial arts. So you're listening to the GSMC MMA podcast. Coming back right after the short break here with some more MMA news. See you soon. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. This is your ultimate stop for everything sports. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Should I say more? From the NFL, MLB, the NBA, to MMA. It's all in here. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Listen now. And we are back. So, one of my favorite fighters, and I think is the most underrated fighter currently in all of mixed martial arts, has to be Charles Oliveira. I genuinely believe Charles Oliveira is good enough. So, this time last year, he was unranked. Now he's ranked number 7th now in the light division. And I'm really happy for him. I think he's he's right, he's developing the second win in his UFC career. Because the guy for the longest time has been pretty much a journeyman in his career. And now he's slowly sliding his way into, hopefully, the top 5 Depending on if he wins in his next matchup here. So it is being reported in by BloodyElbow.com that Charles Oliveira calls out Tony Ferguson and Dustin Poirier. I'm ready, just give me a call. Lightweight contender Charles Oliveira knows who he wants to fight next in the octagon. Unlike many athletes who struggled to stay active during the coronavirus pandemic, lightweight contender Charles Oliveira looks to take advantage of the situation to take some time off and nurse a shoulder injury for the past months. Now all healed up. Though Bronx wants to jump right back into action with a submission win over Kevin Lee back in March, Oliveira scores his seventh, his seventh straight uh, um, stoppage victory in the octagon and now looks at the division's top contenders for his next outing in an interview with AG Fights. Charles Oliveira calls out both former interim champions Tony Ferguson and Dustin Poirier for a match in the near future. I fought, I, I, I fought injured against Kevin Lee, Oliveira said. I had, a soldier, I had a shoulder injury and the pandemic helped me take some time off to recover 100%. And the UFC took some time off too. As soon as the UFC came back, I tried to stay in shape and be ready, just waiting for a call. I called out Conor McGregor, but it didn't work. 
There was Paul Felder, who defeated me, but he doesn't know what he wants. He says he's retired. Um, Paul Felder says he's not. Paul Felder says that he isn't officially retired. He's just semi-retired. So he's going to say, I'm in my I'm in my best moment. Seven straight wins. Five by submissions. Two by knockout. All of it continued. I don't ever leave it in the hands of the judges. My managers have been reaching out to the FC, letting them know, I'm ready. Just give me a call. I'm game against anyone in the top five. I think I would have a war against his Emporia because of his style. Tony Ferguson too. He's a former champion, and we and even though he lost his last fight, he has a he was on a twelve fight win streak before. Surely those would be good names. Before his submission victory over Kevin Lee, Charles Oliveira, who is twenty nine and eight, won no contest. Also scored victories over some notable lightweights during his oppressive streak, including Jim Miller, Clay Guida, and Nick Lenz, a thirty year old. Last loss is a TKO of defeat um, from Paul Felder back in December of 2017. So a good thing there for Charles Oliveira. Now, does he deserve a fight against Dustin Poirier or Tony Ferguson? Well, I believe so. If that makes sense. I believe that he is good enough to defeat any of those people. I say... Okay, so Oliveira versus Dustin Poirier to me makes the most sense. Oliver, um, Dustin Poirier in his last fight against Dan Hooker. Great fight, by the way. Fire their, uh, fire their contender there. It just, I don't see how Dustin Poirier's manager or anyone, or anyone from his fight camp is looking to fight against Oliveira. The one thing that, the one thing that's bad for Oliveira is the fact that although he has wins over at Nick Lenz, Kevin Lee, Jared Gordon, he doesn't have any, like, noteworthy wins. With the exception of being Kevin Lee, who right now, Kevin Lee, he's outside the top 10 rankings. We don't know whether to expect him back. When you look at his star power of Oliver, star power versus somebody in the realm of like Dustin Poirier, Ferguson, Justin Gaethje, can Oliver defeat all those fighters? Yes. I believe he can defeat any of those fighters. Now, will he ever be booked those fighters because of his star power? No, because I think he's really lacking star power right now. The way how I say it right now, since Paul Felder, he's ranked number 6 in the division right now. He's ranked number six. He just lost to Dan Hooker. Oliveira says he's outing for a Paul Felder fight, but I don't see why Paul Felder would like to go match up against Charles Oliveira. Considering that Paul Felder right now, he's calling every single fight in the July Fight Island shows. And he says he expects a long career for broadcasting right now. Felder says he's about semi-retired. So let's think about it. If, if let's say, Felder was inactive. All right, Felder's inactive. Let's go with the idea. If Felder's inactive, then that would place Charles Oliveira being number six. And so his possible matchups are Dan Hooker, Poirier, Ferguson, Justin Gaethje. That's a really good division there. I don't see Khabib fighting anybody right now other than Gaethje and Ferguson. And potentially Connor, just because he's a big name. And also Poirier. Poirier almost defeated Khabib in that one round where he could have pulled a guard and get Gaethje choke on him. So, when I look at the line here, I don't expect Charles Oliveira to fight against Khabib in the next year. I think Oliveira will finally get a title. If he were to win all his fights, if he were to win all his upcoming fights, he gets a title fight against the champion at the time in the year 2022. That's how I believe it. I think right now, Charles Oliveira, he has a lot of, he has a lot of hurdles to go through first. If Felder's unavailable, I'd put Charles Oliveira against Dan Hooker. That could be a five year candidate there, honestly. Oliver versus Hooker, that's a complete toss up. I would choose Oliver winning that fight right now. Oliver is so good. Oliver has everything. His striking ability is on point. He is such an aggressive fighter. He reminds me a lot of Colby Covington's aggressiveness, except a lot more dynamic. And that um Charles Oliver throws on up throws out these like weird high donkey kicks and the like, high kicks. It is Oliver gives you no room in that fight against Kevin Lee. There, Kevin Lee had no breathing room. None. I've never seen anybody pressure a fighter as much as Charles Oliveira did against Kevin Lee. So let's say right now Oliveira versus Dan Hooker. My personal pick would be Oliveira. That would be my personal pick right there. And then if Oliveira were to defeat Dan Hooker, maybe Poirier versus Ferguson makes the most sense. Here's the thing with here's the thing with the lightweight division. You can interchange those fighters multiple times in rematches. You could have Ferguson versus Justin Gaethje fight two more times and not be for the title. You can have Khabib fight against Justin Poirier. You can have Khabib fight against Justin Gaethje twice. You can have Khabib fight against Tony Ferguson twice. And Conor McGregor, 
his name is always being thrown around there, even though he's not really, even though he's like he shouldn't be fighting for the title or fighting top five. His name is always out there, and he's a big name. So Oliveira, he sadly is waiting in line. He's waiting in line, hoping to go get his opportunity. In a dream scenario, it would be Oliveira defeats Stan Hooker. Then from Oliveira, he then defeats Dustin Poirier or Tony Forn- or, or Tony Ferguson the same year. Then a year later, beyond that, he then fights against the number two guy, who could be just in Gaethje, and then fights against Khabib. That's how I'm predicting right now. That, that, that is if Khabib and Gaethje were to go at it, and Gaethje and Khabib were to defend his belt. Because right now, when I look at Oliveira's skill set, Oliveira ha- can defeat all these fighters. Like, he's as much of a dynamic striker as Tony Ferguson. He's And, he, and so, Tony Ferguson... He still had, he was really game against the Justin Gaethje fight. It's just the fact that you know Ferguson he had a short he had a short prep time and was prepping up against Khabib for the longest time, and then he got prepped up against Justin Gaethje. He was a very completely different fighter here. Um, I think Oliveira can defeat Dustin Poirier. I think Oliveira can defeat Hooker. I think Oliveira can defeat Tony Ferguson. I don't know if he's good enough to fight against defeat Justin Gaethje, but if he were to defeat Justin Gaethje, he would then fight against Khabib, and that is if Khabib. Doesn't smoke out all the rest of these other fighters, and then continue to fight against, Con- and then fight Conor McGregor for a rematch. This is because it's a big money fight. So I don't think Oliveira is going to be having a title fight anytime soon. He's probably going to have a title fight coming up in the year 2022 if Oliveira can remain patient and he can have really good victories over his next upcoming opponents. Then I can expect Oliveira competing for the title and Khabib against Charles Oliveira. That's going to be a great fight. I don't think this, the two fighters here that have the greatest chance of possibly defeating Khabib Nurmagomedov will have to be Justin Gaethje and Charles Oliveira. I think Charles Oliveira has a better grappling game than Ferguson. And although Tony Ferguson is arguably a better striker than Oliveira, when it comes to the ground game, Oliveira um, would do a lot more better against Khabib versus Ferguson. So that's really a fun matchup for me. When is Charles Oliveira going to get a style shot? I say around the year 2022. It's a long, that's about two years from now. Oliveira is a proper German fighter here. I can expect him to be a little bit more patient. And so since we're halfway through the year right now, 2020, I know a lot of people are saying, oh, we're only halfway there. Well, hopefully things can go a little bit more faster for the year of 2020. But this is coming from ESPN. They pull out their UFC Major Awards, the top five fighters. Uh, big surprise of the, of the 2020, what's going on right now. And so according to ESPN, the best fight of 2020 has to go to Wally Zhang against Yuan Chechek. Without a doubt about it, if you haven't seen this fight, I always talk about this fight every single podcast. Watch it. It's a great star-making performance for Welly Zhang, and it proves Yuan Chiyajek is just as good now than she was when she lost the belt. Great fight. Best male fighters of 2020. Gilbert Burns and Justin Gaethje. I say Justin Gaethje had the best performance as a male fighter. He was the best performing male fighter. If you look at a singular fight, just engage his uh, performance against Tony Ferguson. Beautiful, amazing. He fought the best fight. He boss. He fought the best fight possible against Tony Ferguson. There, Gilbert Burns to me has to be. So, if you look at singular performances, best single performance by a fighter of twenty twenty, just Gaethje. Best year so far for a fighter has to be Gilbert Burns. In my opinion, Gilbert Burns has fought three times in the past six months. Absolutely ridiculous. And then he fought like four times in the past eight months. And now he's going to be fighting again in just two weeks from now. Gilbert Burns was in nobody's radar a year ago. Absolutely no one's radar. And now he's bumping himself up. So congratulations for Gilbert Burns out there while there are fight. I know Nate Diaz threw a tweet, a tweet out there saying like, it's because of fighters like Gilbert Burns who are always accepting the lowest deals that other fighters aren't, you know, making high, high, high enough money. And I'm kind of in agreement with Nate Diaz there. But then again, um, the world of mixed martial arts, it feels like everybody's out for themselves. They're always out for their own personal best interests. And so Gilbert Burns out for his best interest while Nate Diaz is. And they don't really have to see eye to eye. Um, for the future of their own careers. Best female fighter, Wally Zhang. Yes, without about, without a, I say, like, who has had the best 2020 of this year so far? Gilbert Burns, just because you didn't expect that much off Gilbert Burns. Uh, for Wally Zhang, she did great. She had what has to be one of the best fights ever. You'd say the greatest women's fight of all time in Wally Zhang versus, uh, uh versus Yuan Chechek. And the weird thing about it, just last year, 
the the women's divisions were kind of stagnant. They really were. It's like 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 yeah, Chris Cyborg there. We don't know what her future is in the UFC. You got Mana Nunes. We don't know if she's marketable. Yo, uh, Rosanam Yunus, she's gone. Jessica Andrade was a was pretty much a transitional champion. Now we got this Willie Zhang, and now Willie Zhang pretty much proves that she's a major star in just a short amount of time. So Willie Zhang, so far of the year 2020, best female fighter. Biggest surprise card according to ESPN: Henry Cejudo's retirement on May 9. I don't find it that surprising, really. You know why? Because Henry Cejudo really has nothing to prove in the octagon. He has nothing to prove. So, him, retire, him retiring... Uh, I am in agreement that I think both of those fights, third stoppages went a little bit too early. Uh, the Dominic Cruz fights, the fight went too early. I think the fight should have went on for another couple more minutes. Uh, Dominic Cruz will forever be salty about that same with TJ will overall forever be salty about his fight ending too soon. But again, uh, Henry Cejudo's retirement, I am not surprised by it. I really am not. Um, the dude has done everything he can in the octagon. What right now, the biggest problem with Henry Cejudo's retirement right now is just what is the status of the featherweight in the flight division. Nobody knows. Currently right now, the women's featherweight division, according to Dana White, it's going to be scrapped. It's going to be scrapped, and then all the fighters from the featherweight is going to be prioritized towards competing in the bantamweight division. And I don't really, I don't really see a problem with that. Other than like some fighters being let off. But I myself, I'm always a fan of multiple divisions. I don't mind multiple divisions. I don't mind, I know that some people don't want to reduce the divisions. There's some fighters, since there are a lot of fighters bouncing in and out of divisions. I'm always a fan of more divisions. I'm a fan of always having there be more opportunities for fighters to compete at the right weight class that they feel like they're more comfortable in. I feel like a lot, I feel like here's the thing. I think an anime division would work well. If the feather division is going to be scrapped and they want to implement another division out there, I think Adam with division would be great for the women. That's what I find. I think there are some fighters in the Shark division that would do without find a lot more success and be a lot more better fighters, a lot more better versions of themselves if they're to compete just 10 pounds lighter. That's what I believe. Uh, if you look at uh, the Kay Hansen fight and the Junior Frey fight, Junior Frey is a great fighter. It just she's competing at a division much larger than her. And considering that weight cutting involves fighters fighting really like a division or two like lighter than actually them. Junior Frey is a huge disadvantage just fighting at the Detroit division. Same way with Michelle Watterson. So I think an Adam division would be absolutely great for them. But right now, what's the current size of the women's fight division? Potentially, that could be scrapped. There are rumors going around that the that the men's fight, that the women's that the men's uh, flight division that division could be scrapped. But right now, according to some sources, that's not going to happen, and both the divisions are going to continue on. So I'm happy for that. And I'm happy for um, these healthy divisions going forward. Now, I also did say that Amanda Nunes keeping the featherweight belt would be a bad thing for the women's feather division. And based off my uh, educated guess on that, it came true. The feather division is going to be scrapped because, and I kind of have to blame Amanda Nunes for that. So you're listening to the GSMC MMA podcast. Coming back right after the short break here. See you soon. Want to know the latest in soccer? Then listen to the Golden State Media Concepts Soccer Podcast. From MLS, the World Cup, and the Premier League, we've got you covered. The latest updates, the hottest matches, and news on the league's top players. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Soccer Podcast. David Beckham scores the goal to take England all the way to the World Cup Finals. Listen now. And we are back. So, we are coming to the 12th Annual World MMA Awards, with voting being open by MMA Junkie, John Morgan, Mike John being nominated. So, this is coming from MMAJunkie.com. They are being nominated. Voting is underway for the 12th Annual World MMA Awards, and Henry Cejudo, Zed Asanya, Justin Gaethje, Jorge Masvidal, and Douglas Lima are up for the top honor. Fighters Only Magazine is again hosting the annual awards, and a black tie ceremony is technically planned for October, pending on the state of the coronavirus pandemic. This Usually, this might end in like a virtual like ceremony. <laughs> it, it, it's really lame. I know I have some people who I know. I have some friends who are currently in college right now, and they're going through virtual ceremonies now. It's really bad. Uh, the awards were originally planned on for July eighth in Las Vegas, but were postponed due to the global virus pandemic. As a result, fighters only brought in the eligibility window for the upcoming awards to extend from January one, twenty nineteen, to June thirtieth of twenty twenty. The Charles Mask Lewis Fighter of the Year nominee uh, included Norma Gamidov, 
Musasi, Dustin Poirier, Cormier, and Sung. Female fighters of the female fighters of the year include Valentina Tatiana Sorez, Jessica Andrade, Lima Lima Carfan, and Amanda Nunes. No Wally Zhang. It's weird. MMA junkie, um, MMA junkie, MMA media source of the year, John Morgan, MMA journalist of the year, and Mike Bone, MMA journalist of the year, were also finalists. According to fighters, only a panel of MMA industry experts put together a list of award nominees. That expensive list includes. Who is the Charles Mask Lewis Fighter of the Year? Nominees are going to Henry Cejudo, Israel Desanya, Justin Gaethje, Jorge Masvidal, or Douglas Lima. If we're to look from January 2019 to June 30th, 2020, Fighter of the Year. Hmm. Who is who? Who became the biggest star? Jorge Masvidal. So my my mind is Jorge Masvidal, Israel Desanya. Henry Cejudo. Those are the three fighters. If I were to go based on like accomplishments, it's Henry Cejudo, double belt champion. If that's what matters the most. If you say who had the most exciting rise, Jorge Masvidal, which is going to get you bring, right being underneath him. I would have said Israel Adesanya if I decided I just didn't have that one sneaker performance against Yoel Romero. So right now, and Douglas Lima. Douglas Lima is doing great uh, for himself also at uh, Bellator. But I got to go for Henry Cejudo right now. And here's the thing, for Best Female Fighter of the Year, from January 1, 2019 to June of 2020, we got Valentina Shoshenko, Kayla Harrison, Chris Cyborg, Amanda Nunes, Welly Zhang. It's not Cyborg, so the two, the two, okay, the three here. Oof. Who's been the most dominant? Amanda Nunes. I would say Amanda Nunes is currently the greatest women's fighter in the entire world. When was her fight against Cyborg? Okay, let me let me look at Amanda Nunes. What has she done in the year of uh, 2019 to 2020 between those two? Like, what she's done cumulatively? Okay, so if we're to judge by her accomplishments from early 2019, she defeated Holly Holm, Jermaine Durandamay, Felicia Spencer. She had two incredibly great performances there were Jermaine Durandamay and Holly Holm. All right, then, so let's think about this. Amanda Nunes, she defeated Holly Holm, Jermaine Aranime, and Felicia Spencer. And then we looked at Wally Zhang. She defeated Tisa Torres, Jessica Andrade for the title, and then had a fight of the year candidate against Yuan Aichichek. And then we have Valentin Shoshenko, who had a victory over Jessica Ai, Liz Kimochi, and Kevin Chikagian. So she defended the belt three times there. It's uh, She had a performance of the night bonus there, which was really good. Uh, Wally Zhang had two performances of the nights, and then... She had, uh, and my news had a performance tonight against Holly Holm. Honestly, I think she had, she, had, she had a very, very good underrated victory against Jermaine Aranime. So yeah, it's very tough. It's, uh, very tough. Amena Nunes, her two fights against Holly Holm and Jermaine Aranime were more impressive than any of the fights Valentichenko had. I'm not saying that's, I'm not disrespecting, uh, Valentichenko. And just, if you were to compare the, okay, which of these three divisions are weaker? We got the Bantamweight division. The Charlotte division and the fight division. The fight division right now is the weakest. And although Nunez, the one thing that's capping off Nunez for being possibly the best women's fighter of the year, uh, would be the fact that she had a performance against Felicia Spencer. And Felicia Spencer, she's a game fighter, one of the toughest people out there in the world. But Spencer's um, level of skill and how good a, how good a fighter she is is much lower than Jermaine Aranime and Holly Holm. And also Nunez, um, she kind of had chink in her armor when she fought against Jermaine Aranime. So, when I compare those three performances versus Valentina, Man Nunes' three performances were better than Valentina. And I now look back at Wally Zhang. Wally Zhang's three performances were better than Valentina. So, it comes down to who had, who was the best female performer from January of 2019 to June 30th of 2020. And when I look at this right now, it's Wally Zhang or Man Nunes. It's a complete toss-up depending on what you see, but I'm going to pick right now, Wally Zhang. I'll say Wally Zhang had the better 2019 to 2020 uh, so far, because a she won the title. I always believe winning the title is much more of an accomplishment than defending, t- than defending the title, in my personal opinion. Uh, and also because like nobody really expected Willie Zhang. Man, Nunes, she came into these three fights as the favorite here. She was the overwhelming favorite against Felicia Spencer. She was the favorite against Jermaine Ranami. She was the favorite against Holly Holm. Compared to Willie Zhang here, where she was here's the thing. Willie Zhang only fought twice in the UFC. Before uh, b- uh, before 2019, she only fought twice, so she came in with like although there was a very high expectations of her, 
uh, uh, coming to the UFC, it was very reasonable for one to doubt her when she matched up against, you know, what, legit challengers here in Tease Torres, just going to draw anyone One could have said that Willie Jang was propelled way too early and way too soon to being a, 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 to being a champion, but she, proved, but she proved everyone wrong here. So I say Willie Jang was the best female fighter between January... First of 2019 to June 30th of 2020, off the basis that it was not expected for Willie Jang to achieve this level of success so early in just such a short amount of period of time. And then we got the breakthrough fighter of the year: Willie Jang, uh, Gilbert Burns, Jorge Masvidal, Peter Yan, or Alexander Volkanovsky. So three fighters. Okay, so Jorge Masvidal, Gilbert Burns. Peter Yan, yeah, I, I, it's, I'm, I wouldn't say he's a breakthrough fighter of the year. He's always been good. I just know he's never really given opportunities. Jorge Masvidal, Gilbert Burns, Volkanovski, Welly Zhang. Jorge Masvidal is the most popular fighter who who had the best 2019 campaign in terms of popularity wise. I say right now, who had the best campaign for 2019? Who had the most people talking? Jorge Masvidal. Jorge Masvidal became the biggest star. Willie Zhang, second. Volkanovski defeated Max Holloway out of nowhere. And then Gilbert Burns, so far in 2020, is the best. So, who is having the best 2020 so far? Burns, Volkanovski, Willie Zhang. Willie Zhang and Gilbert Burns are in the front. And if Burns were to... No, no. I think... If, if Gilbert Burns were to count... If we were to count the next two weeks, and Gilbert Burns were to defeat Kamar Usman, then Burns easily... Um, this is a complete toss-up here. I don't know who to vote for, Volkanovski, Wally Zhang, Burns, or Jorge Masvidal. Because who became the biggest star in 2019? Jorge Masvidal. Who the, who's the second biggest star? Wally Zhang. Who came out of nowhere? Alexander Volkanovski. Who didn't, uh, who had the best series of victories in 2019-2020? In Give it a Burns. So I don't know who to pick for that one. I don't. International Fighter of the Year. Kamar Usman, Valentin Shevchenko, Ang Lang uh, Sang, uh, Wally Zhang, Valentina, Israel Desanya. International fight of the year that could go that can go to anyone. That could really go to absolutely anyone. I, it's hard for me to judge who had the better 2020. Wally Zhang or Kamar Usman. Would you say Israel Desanya had a better um, year than Usman? Would you say Valentin Shevchenko has been the most dominant fighter out of everyone here? Ang La and Song, if you guys have never heard of her, she's a current uh, women's champion right now. She's one of the best fighters in the entire world. It's a toss up. It's a complete toss up here. Alright, so from January of uh, 2019 to June 30th of 2020, fight of the year Josh Emmett versus Shane Burgos, great fight. Dustin Poirier versus Dan Hooker, great fight. Isola Sanya versus Kevin Gastelum. That was that was a shocker how good it was shocking how good that fight was in my opinion. I didn't expect that much out of it, but it was great. It was one versus Kobe Covington. Kamara was one versus Kobe Covington. That was a great fight, but I didn't think but I wasn't all that impressed by that fight compared to the other fights here. Wally Zhang versus Yuan Chechek. So according to Rose Namunis, who doesn't think Wally Zhang versus Yuan Chechek wasn't the best fight of the year because there was a lot more offense than there was defense. Off my personal viewpoint, what I personally enjoyed um watching these fights the most fun fight to me that I have seen this year has to be Welly Zhang versus Wani Chechek. That to me was my is my personal fight of the year. All the subjective. My second favorite fight of the year is Adesanya versus Kevin Gastelum. Third, Josh Emmett versus Shane Burgos. Then it would be the Sapori versus Dan Hooker. And then Kamar Usman versus Kobe Covington. And the reason I'm ranking Kobe Covington versus Kamar Usman being pretty low is because of the fact that these two guys are really good. <laughs> Neither of them even attempted a takedown. They just don't. They just didn't. We got two wrestlers turned strikers, and I've seen better striking by other fighters. And although they they're both really good strikers, I think I would have enjoyed it a lot more if there was a lot more grappling involved between these two fighters here. That's why I put Usman and Kobe Covington being the fifth best fights of uh, between 2019 and 2020. Knockouts of the year: Jorge, Jorge Masvidal versus Ben Askren. Cody Garvin versus Rafael Sunsau, Anthony Pettis versus Steven Thompson, Sean O'Malley versus Eddie Wineland, Douglas Lima versus Michael Page. So, <laughs> this is going to be really... Douglas Lima, Michael Page. Great. Jorge Masvidal versus Ben Askren. Great. These are all great knockouts. 
Oh, great. The two knockouts that stand out for me more than anything else, Douglas Lima and Michael Page, and then Jorge Masvidal and Ben Askren. Those are the two knockouts that stand out more to me than anything else. And the fact that I went out of my way to watch Jorge Masvidal versus Ben Askren several times, more so than I saw Douglas Lima versus Michael Page, I pick Jorge Masvidal versus Ben Askren being the knockout of the year. Because that that pretty much changed the course for two fighters for two for two careers of two fighters. Ben Askren, like there was rumors going around at the time that he was going to be fighting for a title, but it didn't but it didn't happen because of this loss. If it weren't for this knockout, Ben Askren would be a completely different person right now compared to Jorge Masvidal and how we see them in their respective MMA careers. Like Ben Askren is a huge what if. Like if he wasn't knocked out, he would have been an all time great in the lightweight division. Like that's just. How much stock there is, was on Ben Askren. And Jorge Masvidal, he was pretty much a gatekeeper up until that point, And then he became a superstar. So good for him. No disrespect to Cody Garben or Fred Sunsau or O'Malley versus Eddie Wildland. I just say Jorge Masvidal versus Ben Askren. That was a knockout The more people were talking about than any other knockouts here. Douglas Lima versus Michael Page. Great knockout also. That was my second favorite knockout of the year. Submission of the year. Brett Primus versus Tim Wilde. Bryce Mitchell versus Matt Sales. That's a good one. If you guys haven't seen a Bryce Mitchell against Matt Sal- uh, uh, Sal- uh, Salas, great one. Damian Meyer versus Ben Askren. Uh, can I be about that? Uh, Avi Ghazali against Edward uh, Moravitsky. That's a good one. Mishy uh, Krikunov against Jimmy Krutz. That's a nice one also. My my picker, Bryce Mitchell versus Matt Salas, is my submission of the year. That's my submission of the year. It's also an over- overall great performance by Bryce Mitchell. He's, to me, one of the most underrated fighters in the entire um, roster. Comeback of the year. Steepy Mitchell versus Daniel Cormier. Eddie Alvarez versus um, Edward Flaying, uh, Jacques Ronaldo Souza, no, uh, yeah, no, Rosenstrike against Alistair Overeem, sorry for that. Uh, Peter Quayley against Ryan Scope, and in Cody Garbrandt's career. Cody Garbrandt's career is considered a comeback. I think we'll Cody Garbrandt, really. Because Cody Garbrandt, sheesh, man. His career has plummeted since the TG Dillashaw thing. And him going to New Jersey and finally, like, accepting the fact that Team Alpha Male ain't as good as they think they are. I gotta go for comeback of the year towards Cody Garbrand. Upset of the year. Alexander Volkanovski is back Holloway. Easy. That's that's my pick. Um, Eddie Alvarez? Eddie Alvarez? That's not, um, to me, was that was not mostly a shocker. That wasn't really a shocker to me. Volkanovski versus Max Holloway. Everyone picked Holloway in that fight. Everyone. Overwhelming favorite. Holloway, Holloway was. So, um, Volkanovski was the favorite, was, um, was the winner of that award here. So, we got a lot more awards here. Uh, uh, best Gym of the Year, San for MMA, American Top Team, American Kickboxing Academy, Referee of the Year, Herb Dean, uh, Jason Herzog, Frank Trigg, uh, Mike Beltran, Trainer of the Year, Andre Hicks, um, Su- uh, Soon Singh, Bo Sandoval, Phil Darum. Uh, the list goes on and on here. The voting is indeed open, and I can't wait to see who wins this. So overall, MMA has been awesome. Mixed martial arts has been awesome in the past year. And I can't wait to see what to expect from coming forward. Because Fight Island is just two weeks away. we got multiple fights coming up. we got major title fights happening. we got the return of Rosalind Muniz. Volkanovski versus Max Holloway. Fight Island. CP Miocic against Daniel Cormier coming up in August. we got a lot of fights being uh, coming up soon. And I'm excited for it. And I really can't wait. And that brings us a close to today's podcast. I'm excited for MMA in the year of 2020 and 2021. All I gotta say is thank you. Thank you for tuning into the GSMC MMA Podcast brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I'd like to ask you, please remember to subscribe to the show and write a nice review. That really helps us. Also, if you can please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Thank you and have a good night. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts MMA Podcast, part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. From movies to music, from sports to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program.